We are thrilled to kick off the, the spring 2014 lectures with photographer Lois Greenfield. Originally from New York, Lois attended Brandeis University, where she majored in anthropology and expected to become an ethnographic filmmaker. Instead, she went on to work as a photojournalist for local Boston newspapers. Eventually, she specialized in photographing dancers and movement. Lois has created classic images for the world's foremost dance companies, Alvin Ailey, Martha Graham, Merce Cunningham, Paul Taylor, Bill T. Jones, Arnie Sane, and American Ballet Theater, to name a few. In 1992, her book, Breaking Bounds, The Dance Photography of Lois Greenfield, was published by Tams Hudson in Chronicle in the States, right? Yeah. In 1998, Tams and Hudson published a second book entitled Airborne, for which I did the silver printing. Uh, <laughs> I miss those times, Lois. That was a lot you of fun. Really miss yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Lois had to put up with a lot of uh, very loud salsa music coming from that dark room. Uh, and in, in return, she taught me a thing or two about uh, working professionally at the highest level, for which I am very grateful. Um, since her first exhibition at ICP in 1992, her work has been shown in museums and galleries, including the French Foundation of Photography, the Musée de l'Elysée in Lausanne, Tel Aviv Art Museum, and the Venice Biennale. Her images have been showcased in international art and dance festivals, such as the Nordic Light Festival, Jacob's Pillow, Pingyao Photo Festival, Biennale de la Danse, and Melbourne Art Festival. Her commercial clients include Raymond Weil, Sony, Disney, Rolex, Haynes, Pepsi, Johnson & Johnson, Epson & Kodak. So please help me welcome Lois to our lecture mm -hmm. series. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you, Jaime, for the lovely introduction. It really is a special moment when we can reconnect in our different capacities. And I'm so proud of all the gorgeous photography that I wish I could take credit for, your gorgeous photography that I can't take credit for in any way that I helped you with it, but it's, I'm just so thrilled with the acclaim, the deserved acclaim and recognition you're getting for your work. So, all right, so I guess I have to begin. Um, so I've titled this particular presentation The Enigmatic Moment, and um, I, did, I titled it that because I'm photographing these um, minute split seconds, but um, split seconds of reality that are not facts. They're mysteries, and they invite the viewer to decipher them, but nothing is revealed. There's no answer. There's no rational discourse that can explain what's actually happening in the picture. So, oh, how did that get in this? Did you slip this in? <laughs> OK, well, that's interesting. This is a second. Uh, a sarcophagus from the second century AD. And actually, I did put it in. And I uh, did take the picture. But um, I took it with my cell phone. And um, it's here really only to represent that when I was in Istanbul, I talk in like zigzag. So it's going to take a minute to get used to my train of thought, because um, it derails constantly. But I was in Istanbul teaching last January. And I took myself to the archaeology museum and was astounded by the uh, sarcophagi there. And um, actually, I, I whipped out my camera to take some pictures. And what struck me was that this style, this art form, if you will, was a precursor to the kind of photography I'm doing now. Because I do the stop action photographs, and um, the sarcophagus, the sides of them are like bar reliefs. I guess they are bar reliefs. And they uh, represent a decisive moment in which the action and the gestures and the relationship of the people and the story they're telling um, all come together in a way that the human eye can't see it. So it's almost as if what was sculpted was sculpted from a photograph. So I, I feel there's a kind of analogy there. And um, I feel that's great. <laughs> you know, I've got some historical basis. Um, for my particular area of inquiry. So speaking of area of inquiry, um, the passage of time. So I've been photographing dance for 40 years. And um, people assume that I have an inherent interest in dance, or I was a dancer, 
or something like that. I do love to dance, but I was never a dancer nor aspired to be one, and I don't have any real interest in choreographed movement. So uh, I'm sure you want to see pictures instead of hearing me talk. But what I realized over the years was that I am ostensibly a dancer, a photographer who photographs movement, but my real interest is in, in photographing time. And what the dancer does is give uh, time a materiality and a substance. Otherwise, how do you photograph time? I mean, we can do it in time-lapse photography. There are different ways. I'm not saying this is the only way, of course. But um, I feel that the dancers, as I just said, it, um, provide the passage of time. So that's why I call this the passage of time. So this picture was one of, I'm going to back up now. <laughs> so where I came from and how I got here. So Jaime explained that I did major in anthropology and I did hope to be an ethnographic filmmaker. So that didn't happen. And um, after graduating from college, I started working for local newspapers in the Boston area and uh, was on that trajectory to be a photojournalist. Um, what happened was that as part of my assignments, which included being backstage at rock and roll concerts, being up front in riots and demonstrations, being locked into um, maximum security prisons, because I had a panoply of uh, assignments, and this was in the early 70s, so it was a really good era for a lot of good stuff <laughs> photographically. But um, when I was assigned to cover dance concerts, um, I wasn't particularly excited, but I found that there was a freedom I had in photographing dance that I didn't have with portraying the news, because the editors would judge the pictures or choose my pictures, not based on composition, lighting, and form, but based on the story they told. So I didn't disagree with their editorial uh, input, but I realized I wanted to be more on the art side and less on the document side, not that you can't merge the two, and uh, the, the photographers I admire the most, really, in some ways, are the documentary photographers for different reasons, so I'm not putting that down in any way, shape, or form. So anyway, I got hooked into this dance thing, and not knowing anything about it, I just started learning how to shoot it, and I went to dress rehearsals and dress rehearsals, moved to New York, went to dress rehearsals, etc., for really almost 10 years, photographing the dance for the Times and the magazines and <clears throat> 20 years for the Village Voice. And um, what this picture is up for goes back to my interest in time, because this early picture um, was taken on a stage. And <clears throat> what interests me about it is basically that the arc of the scarf transcribes the arc of her movement, the trajectory of her movement. So the past is made visible by the scarf because we know where her arm moved. And it seemed to me that when you photo, I'm talking about photographing passage of time, you have dancers jumping around, but the shot is a very static shot. It could be an arabesque or a leap, and there's really no sense of movement in it at all. And um, the moment you add a material that in the time base is, is kind of encoded in that material. The most famous dance picture, I don't have it on the thing, is um, by Barbara Morgan, who was the pioneer of dance photography, started in the 30s photographing Martha Graham. And there's a picture called Letter to the World, and it's Martha Graham herself. I'm not going to embarrass myself by <laughs> trying to <laughs> demonstrate it, but it's a kind of arabesque penche, and there's a huge skirt that comes up in a little wave. If you imagine that picture without the skirt, you've got just another arabesque. So that skirt tells you the whole story of her emotion and um, the, the implied narrative and everything. So that's where I stand with that. Now, so moving on. Um, so after 10 years of photographing, as I explained, during dress rehearsals, I really started to bristle at being a documenter of someone else's art form. And people would look at the pictures and say, oh, what a great shot of Barishnikov up in the air. And I would say, well, it's a great dancer performing a great dance move, but it's really not a great shot. It's kind of like target practice where you capture something. <laughs> and there's no particular artistry in the picture. It's just a window on the event. 
So I wanted to find a way to fuse my, the media that my passion of being my passion in photography with my elected subject matter, which was dance. And I wanted to come up with something that um, was unique and could only exist as a photograph. So I kind of experimented with different time bases. So this picture was taken with a strobe and a long exposure and is something that you can't see with your naked eye. This became in the, this was the late 70s and that was my uh, threshold of interest really. If you could take a picture that either made sense, that you could make a rational sentence explanation for it, I wasn't interested. And if it was something that you could just see with your naked eye, I wasn't interested in it. So um, this fit the bill. This is, and um, then I'm going to just mention at this point, um, when I was doing this photojournalism in Boston, I went to hear Dwayne Michael speak at MIT. And listening to him talk totally implanted the seed in my artistic brain, not to necessarily just take what's in front of me, as I said, but to um, make this fusion into something which is a uniquely photographic event that was instigated. So I just printed out, I interviewed him back in the 70s. And um, just reading through the article, I want to read you this short quote from him. And this is his point of view, and I don't ascribe to and, you know, all of it, but it's um, very influential. He's very iconoclastic in general. Um, I hope the young people here get to hear him. He's a fabulous um, speaker. He's also a riot. And um, I think there's really a lot philosophically behind his work. So he writes, uh, he said, sorry, photographers should not reinforce our prejudiced and preconceived notions about reality. What they should do is make us question reality. There are two kinds of photographs. One that I, one that he calls, found photographs, which deal with events that would occur without, which the, without the photographer's presence. Then there are other photographs which are those which would have had no life at all if the photographer hadn't made them happen, hadn't created them. And he goes on to say that 99% of what he has done falls into that second category, making him realize the incredible power of the imagination. So I was about 22 when I heard this, and I didn't start doing the work that I became known for till I was 30, but that idea got lodged in my brain before I even had a, a way to, to, to bring it to life. Um, so that was going to be my watchword then, to take pictures that you couldn't see on a stage and that also I took it one step further that needed the um, collaboration, you know, needed that photographic alchemy to make it visible as a photograph. So again, before I really got rolling with anything, I was experimenting with the time base. And this is a picture that of a fire juggler that represents what you could see if you were there. And this was just taken with a Smith Victor bare bulb. I didn't have strobes. I didn't know anything about it. And I decided then to, you know, to just vary the shutter. And I realized that you know, I could take unnatural chunks of time, which, um, again, can only be seen. I'm gonna, I can't repeat this all night, so I'm going to not say it again. but. Um, but so I could divide, I could photograph unnatural chunks of time. OK. So then I flipped the other way. And I decided to do stop action uh, kind of pictures, which um, involve a short s shutter speed and strobes. I'd now gotten strobes because I'd started doing some commercial work. And um, that became basically you know, my passion for you know, many, many years. Um, and, and working improvisationally. So these are just two pictures which um, are from the Breaking Bounds book era and uh, represent my, my first forays into creating some you know, new and what was then a radical way of photographing dance because they weren't really dancers and um, they're contained in this box, and it's in a square, and it's in a studio, and you know it has no reference to anything. 
Um, so that's where I stand with that. So here comes the sculpture moment. I'm looking at notes because this is like the second time I've organized it this way. And um, of course, the categories bleed. But this is about, in some ways, my inspiration. Um, I spent a semester in Florence junior year. And I, I was not you know, really an art history student. But naturally, I absorbed the fabulous art that was there. So this is a um, picture of Bernini's, I think it's the Rape of Proserpina. And I realized retrospectively that I was extremely influenced by all the Renaissance artists and Michelangelo and everyone in my work, which I, I may not be showing tonight. But for example, this picture, which was sort of my version of an Exodus moment, um, which I had seen, you know, so many biblical themes in Florence that really um, resonated with me, not on a religious level, but on either a mythological level or an emotional level or a level of passion. And um, so I, in a way, started thinking of my dancers retrospectively as sculptures. And um, it's interesting because these two dancers, which were, this picture was on the cover of my, my book, Breaking Bounds, um, he would describe himself as a ball of clay, which he would throw up, you know, he would jump up in the air as a ball of clay and self-sculpt him when he's up there. And um, so, and my lighting was always sculptural with a lot of shadows. In part, it was sculptural because I wanted anything that was not going to look like a performance. So I went a white background instead of a dark background. I went for sculptural light instead of theater light. Um, for the most part, I didn't want them in costumes. Sometimes, as you've seen, they were in just you know regular coat and tie kind of things. Or I wanted them stripped down like sculptures so that if they were wearing something, they weren't going to be nude, but it was going to be with a classical reference. And um, the other thing is that you're all, you haven't seen all the pictures yet, but most people imagine that I shoot with continuous action, um, what we used to call motor drive, and I don't. And I think it's, it's un I shoot in the most um, archaic method possible in this day and age. So, because people think, oh, I must take a million pictures and I pick some which are good. So I have a Hasselblad from the 80s, which is on a tripod in my studio. And I pre-focus because I don't have autofocus. Now, I could have autofocus in the new Hasselblads, but the shutter isn't as responsive as I need it to be. So even the manual, oh, <laughs> I'll just go on and say, like, this is the, <laughs> the manual is the most responsive Shutter. No yeah, but I, but okay. <laughs> um, the whole art form is one that requires. It's an art of anticipation. It's anticipatory. You can't look through the viewfinder, see a nice picture. Should I take it? I don't know. Maybe I'll wait. You know, you can't do that. You can't even wait till you see it. So you have to just shoot it as it's about to happen. And I know when I teach workshops and the students like to look through the camera, I say, please don't look at the camera. If you're on a tripod, you're, you're, they're going to be in your picture. And if you're not, actually, you get some damn happy accidents. But um, they will shoot anyway with the motor. And I say, why do you, are you giving away your artistic you know, decision to an arbitrary interval of time? Mm -hmm. And I'll be standing next to them, and they'll see fabulous things will be happening. And I'll look at their pictures, or they'll look at the pictures and say, I didn't get anything. And I said, of course not, because you didn't take any picture. You know, you have to learn to sensitize yourself to what's in front of the camera. The timing seems difficult at first, but you get the hang of it. And it's very personal, which is good. My timing is actually not typical timing, and I can talk about that later. So um, I don't really feel the motor drive really helps anyone. I, I can't say that I might not also like to have a second moment out of a given jump. But the way I work is so I'm planted on the ground. The lights are for a specific uh, part of my studio. And that's because I love the sculptural lighting. So I can't just have lights anywhere. I have to work with the dancers so that they're lit the way I want them lit, which also depends on what they're going to be doing. And for this picture, for example, they were each on one end of the 
studio, and it was like one, two, three, go, and they went up and they pretzeled themselves up there and came back, and, and I, I took, so they pretzeled themselves up and I took one picture. They come down, of course, the old dancers have to land on the ground, <laughs> and then they go to the sides, and we count one, two, three, and they go again, and I got, you know, maybe 12 different versions of it, because there were 12 exposures on the roll. Um, so it is really archaic, it is really a nuisance, but um, I actually see the picture happening. I mean, I can't describe the picture when I'm shooting it, but in the old days when we used to shoot film, which ended in something like 2002, I kind of knew what I was getting. I, didn't, I couldn't you know, draw you a picture of it, but we had a strong sense, right? Yeah, you would see the uh, after image. The after, after the image, scroll yeah. And we just sort of felt it. So, um, yeah, so that's it. It's just such an old-fashioned, counterintuitive way of shooting movement. But that way I also get to direct and, and help sculpt them and give them, because it's a 50-50 collaboration between what they, I base what I do on what they give me, and then I kind of mold it and help it and shape it and also hope for happy accidents to come. Okay, that was long on that one. Um, and then working with the square, which I'm only say in passing, since all my early work was based on the square, provided unusual entrances and exits from the picture, and forced, as Jaime and I were talking earlier, the emphasis was on the composition because you have the negative space and the forms um, work better when they're with the cropping, I guess. It's with the defined border. Uh, and what I like about the square is that it's um, not a natural way of seeing. I think we all see, I'm seeing this room from Tom to Jaime and then maybe, you know, cutting off under the projector. So I'm seeing it in a DSLR format. And so once you start to shoot as a square, which is usually used for portraits and fashion where the person's in, in it someplace, but you're trying to get something kinetic, um, you often crop them out, which was a blessing in this case. Um, but I think that having that restriction of a format that was not conducive to shooting dance helped me come up with a different um, aesthetic strategy. So I'm grateful for that. And I would encourage anyone to put as many restrictions in their path. Because otherwise, we just do things the same way. We're sort of taught a visual syntax of how things should look. And then we copy them, because that's the way it's supposed to look. And it's hard to jostle yourself off and get a perspective that is unique. And that's actually what drew me to photography, was that I feel that I'm sort of limited in my own perceptions of the world. And if I look at someone else's photographs, I see the world in a different way. So I think we all have to shake those, you know, the sunset. Not that anyone here takes sunsets necessarily, but I mean, we are, we've, it's a language and we've internalized the, um, uh, what, I don't quite have the word for it, but we've in, in, internalized that way of thinking about pictures as references to thoughts or situations that are already pre-coded in our brain. And actually, the reason why I still do this after 40 years is because when I go into the studio to, to do, you know, whatever improvisational art I want to do, I rarely have an idea. I'll show you one or two pictures later in which maybe I started out with an idea. But for me, the fascination is the process of going beyond my imagination. So rather than going with a layout or I want this, 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 I'm open to whatever happens. And what happens as a collaboration between the dancers, my team, the, and uh, Chance, is exceeds my imagination. So it's like, wow, it's a, you know, you don't even know you're discovering something and and you've got it. Okay. So another thing about this stop action thing, I shoot at a my do you want technical stuff? Okay. <laughs> I am the least technical, but okay. So <laughs> I shoot it at 250th of a second, but the key factor in this whole thing, you're all writing it down. I can't believe it. <laughs> Do you want my f-stop? <laughs> Do you want the exposure on the background? <laughs> um, I'll give it to you as if I remembered it. But um, what was I saying? 250th of a second. 250th of a second, right. But that, it's actually the exposure is a 2,000th of a second because I'm using strobes. 
and I'm using strobes that stop the action at 2,000 of a second. I've had these strobes for a while, they're from Braun Color, and now you can get them at 4,000 and 6,000 even more. But, you know, I'm stuck in my old, my old ways, and I'm not sure what I would accomplish by that. But um, 2,000, is you can, you can exceed that. Um, is but the going up or down? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's an amazing picture. She's going up because he's pulling her up. I mean, it's a magnetic force. I put magnets on his hands <laughs> and on her feet, you know. And... Um, wow. No, actually, I didn't. I asked, I asked her if she could balance on her hair, and she did. So I really had a lot of time to. <laughs> it is. Oh, it is. Okay, so that's Jamie. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Okay, yeah, they're old, old friends. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the exposure is two thousandths of a second, and that is what gives the picture this surreal look. I mean, because we as viewers equate the time we spend viewing it with the duration of the event. So it's like, how did it happen? It's, it's got to be Photoshop. Well, I can honestly say I do not use Photoshop for any purpose other than to change a color of a floor or to get rid of, you know, sweat stains or something like that. But I don't recombine or reconfigure. I'm not interested in it. I think it's just not of interest to me. I'm not putting down anyone that does it, but um, you know, I, I want to, I like the surreality in the reality or in the document. And as much as I tried to distance myself from documentary photography when I left photographing dress rehearsals, I now proudly say, <laughs> this is a document. Had you been there, you would have seen it. You couldn't have seen it because our eyes don't, can't register a two thousandth of a second. But if they could, you would have seen it. Or at least you would have seen the whole movement happen. So, um, so that's why everything looks so surreal. I think I ought to talk faster. <laughs> I'll never get through this. OK, so we're back in sculpture, and we're back in the Villa Farnese, I think, where Bernini's sculptures were, back with that Rape of Proserpina. And his, like many sculptures, well, not uh, like many sculptures, they're meant to be seen in the round. Mm -hmm. So for example, this is the back, and this is the front, and of course, there are all these sides. Well, my studio is like a proscenium with a backdrop, and I'm then locked into one perspective. But I usually circumnavigate the dancers or ask them to make a rotation, because unlike in the theater, I can get all these different perspectives. So an example of that is this, which I may print it for the cover of one of, one of the editions of Airborne, which was the name of the book. And um, this is the same movement taken from the side. Not at the same time, of course. Mm. Going the wrong way. OK. So that's why I, again, think very sculpturally. OK, so again, being influenced by sculpture and art in Florence, um, Michelangelo was really the, the big ticket. His strong yet graceful figures, the gesture, you know, Adam and, and man and all this, I think really influenced me because I spend most of my time with facial expressions and gestures. And again, the themes, the sort of biblical themes, themes of fleeing when I edit my pictures, although I, I realize that I have an inordinate, thank you, an inordinate number of pictures of flight. Not flying airborne, but fleeing. OK, so again, sculpture, they're very stilled, but um, they, you feel as though they've fallen or moved. I'm not going to talk about every picture. I'll just show. Um, again, there's an inversion of solidity and movement because this dancer looks as though she's supported by her skirt, mm -hmm. which is impossible by the laws of physics as we know them. So she's doing, she's whipping her legs up and the, she's whipping the skirt around and then her legs. You can barely see her arm, but she's doing a one-armed handstand. And um, yeah, so it just like photography makes it solid. And ditto with this, this kind of very shiny, I'm not exactly sure what fabric it was, but you know, when, when stilled, it, it looks like sculpture. Invisible forces. So the white background, I mean, the white background can be seen as a neutral 
background on which we put the specimen of the subject, but I like to see it as um, an invisible force, which is affecting, which is a, which is has a causal relationship with the dancer. So a big wind has come, and this dancer is now caught up in this scarf, and is moving, and. It's as though she's not the agent of what happened, which of course she is, because she had to take a step and throw the scarf and do all this stuff, but it just looks like it's happening to her. And I think this is somewhat of a, well, I don't want to step, but I know it, but some Chinese friends have told me that that's a kind of uh, concept in Chinese art, that the background is very active. and. Um, and again, I don't use Photoshop, so we just work long and hard to find a way to, through experimentation, to make, for example, this scarf um, rhyme the movement of the dancer. And that's why, again, I can't stress enough how much of a collaboration this is, because I can have an idea, but I can't make anyone execute it. Actually, execute's a really bad word. Embody it. <laughs> I don't believe in executing anybody. <laughs> Okay, so another example of, of the invisible atmosphere. But actually, you know, many dance, there are many dance photographers. When I started out, there weren't that many. But um, the, one of the differences between my work and the other legion of talented dance photographers is that they seem to show a lot of effort and strain to show, look how strong I am, look how powerful, look how muscled I am or whatever. And I tend to photograph my dancers more in a relaxed state so it seems effortless. And actually, to me, that makes them more heroic than someone who's straining and struggling to, to do whatever they're doing. But that's just personal taste. Okay. So I love this story. I love this story. I love the story. <laughs> I love the story I'm going to tell you as much as I love the picture. Um, because it really represents how blessed I am, how lucky I am to be working with dancers who are phenomenal people. This was a shot taken during a casting session for um, a poster for the JVC Jazz Festival in the um, late, actually, around the turn of the century. And um, so my idea, of course, was to have a dancer as a jazz musician flying in and playing the, the double bass. So I had an audition, which I do for commercial jobs, and, and this fellow who I had used before came. And he came all dressed up, you know, a smart person comes dressed to fit the part. And um, we had an assistant holding the double bass. Were you there for this? No. An assistant holding the double bass. And um, the dancer was supposed to jump up, play the, the, the frets, whatever, and then the assistant jumps out and, and then he lands and everyone lives happily ever after. <laughs> but um, he couldn't do it. He was the first one. He couldn't do it. He said, you know what, Lois, I can't do it. I'm sorry. But can I stay and help all the other people coming? Because he was a gymnastic coach and I could help them. I said, sure, thank you so much. So at the end of the day, he said, oh, Lois, I think I figured out how to do it. Let me try. So I, of course, was taking Polaroids because this was pre-digital. I was shooting film. And um, so you know, I saw he was getting it, and I just thanked my lucky stars that I was smart enough to actually put a roll of film in, because these moments never come back, I mean, ever. So, um, so we got this in a few shots, and the next day, of course, it was different. They didn't want this background, which was from another job, and everything was all different. So, but I love the picture for so many reasons, including the fact that I, I get very emotional about my relationship to the dancers and how generous they are as people, and what great collaborators they've been over the years. Depicting time. OK, that's my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. So this, this series I want to show you is a campaign um, that I did for a big watch company in the 90s. And it was pretty all over then. And what do I want to say about it? I'm not sure. Um, basically, I was asked to. Um, depict the concept of precision movements. And they saw a picture I took in one of the books and asked me if I could replicate it or do something similar. So um, this is really to show what really happened. Now, we took many, many, many contact sheets. But um, I like to show this always to prove that nothing was photoshopped, by the way. Um, 
So it's endless repetition and variations on a theme. There's, there's no mats. There was just maybe a little padding underneath the backdrop. And this was another one. And our friend over there smiling at us was the same fellow as with the double bass. And this was my concept to, um, to illustrate the gears of a watch. So each one of them is supposed to be. And um, once again, it really happened. I mean, it's, it starts off slowly. But the dancer's skill is to not to execute the movement, but to do it in the right place and at a time coordinated with the other people. And dancers and gymnasts can all um, visualize themselves in space so they can be pretty consistent. And then the only thing left is really the timing so they're all doing it at the same time. And I'm not sure if the picture I picked, that they picked, is is on this sheet or not. It's kind of a fake sheet. One half is one sh shot and the other has another shot. And the last one was uh, this one. So, becoming. Okay, after the, the Breaking Bounds book came out, which had a lot of athletic and gymnastic and impossible moments, all very stop action and surreal, as I've said, I wanted to do something where um, it looked as though things were actually transforming before your eyes, even though it, it is still a split second of, of an exposure. So I invited this dancer in. It was the second time we worked together. He um, actually was a site-specific performer, not much of a um, you know, classical dancer. And we threw flour on him. My, this was the one of the only times that um, I did have an intention, not a layout, but an intention, and that was I wanted him to look as though he were in an hourglass, and you inverted the hourglass, and the sand comes down, and the viewer is imagining the sand as a, as a human figure. And then you imagine the moment after is just a puddle of sand. But people have said to me, whoa, it looks like a Vatican ritual, it looks like Pompeii, it looks like Auschwitz, and I love that because I'm never trying to portray a specific thing. This was actually taken for a dance company that I work with many, many years, Feld Ballet, that we spoke about. And um, so what happens now when I shoot dance companies, actually for the past probably 20 years, they come to my studio and bring some props. So the dance involved shredded newspapers and uh, they brought them and this is the dancer and then we brought fans and I don't remember all the details, it's lit from above <coughs> and we turned the fans on and just went crazy and when they stuck to his face was, um, I start directing him, do this, do that or whatever and what I love about this shot is that it's chaos and it's a moment where the chaos coheres into something really perfect and he's like the god of creation. This is the same dancer uh, with the same dance company in a different dance and um, I work with, so I was talking about my post Breaking Bounds era where I'm working with a lot of props and stuff so I, I collect things, I frankly garbage pick things and whether they're shredded newspapers or fabrics or beads or drop cloths, um, shredded newspapers now, we start shredding everything. Um, I just have them handy. So the dance hadn't been created, and, um, but I had to take a picture of it. And if my recollection is correct, they brought the plexiglass cube and by lighting him from below in this plexiglass, it kind of to me looked like ice or water or fire or somehow again a moment of becoming something else and this too especially this dancer the same one you saw drenched in flour um, this was the first time we worked together and he brought this jute sculpture that he made and um, I didn't know what the hell to do with it it was massive and heavy and um, you know, my answer to everything is always, you know, can you jump? <laughs> so, <laughs> like jumping solves every <laughs> problem. If you don't know what to do, just ask them to jump. And uh, so he did. And um, the reason why the picture looks like it does is because I was talking about timing before. And um, 
I don't believe, well, I don't tend to shoot on what they call the peak moment. The peak moment is the height of the jump or the height of the expression, but it tends to be a little static. So because they're there in stasis. So I prefer the moments where they're going up slightly or going down slightly. And then the face is relaxed and it takes on a different narrative and emotional context. If you're just, everyone's up there like this, it's a little stiff. So he's actually coming down because the rope is above him. Actually, the fellow that has done my two books, William Ewing, he curates them, and we're working on a third now. He thought this was actually a still life. <laughs> and I said, I don't even know how to photograph anything that's not moving. I mean, that's the hardest thing for me to do, is take a portrait of someone <laughs> that doesn't move. OK, the ambiguous moment. So this series is. Um, things where they can be looked at two different ways. So for example, you, maybe half the group here will think that she's being chased by the tsunami of a mirror, or is she being sucked into the vortex of the mirror? Um, and I like those two equal possibilities or, or possible realities. I love this too. Someone once said, um, some professional printer printed it and said, when I picked it up, how many hours did it take your retoucher to do all those reflections? And I said about five minutes to, to clean it up because, again, it's, it's, not, it's not done that way. So this one of Ashley, mm -hmm. for the Ashley fan here, um, is she landing or is she coming off? I love the fact that there's just no fixed thing. Now, the Jeopardy question for the audience here is, and I've already given you the hint, is he coming up or coming down? <laughs> I think half the audience says up and half says down. Well, there are two ways of looking at it. If he's coming down, well, actually, there are three ways. I'll just, I'll, cu I'll cut to the chase. His hair is going up, so he's coming down. Um, he has gone up, of course, and then, as we know from gravity, it, it has to come down. Except in photography, it doesn't have to come down. That is the other great thing about the square. People can exit the frame from above as though the gravitational force was um, off screen. And here I took this idea a little further with adding the conundrum of the fact that the white sheet that he's landing on seems on one reading to be connected to the background, so it's all perceived vertically. And the other way to perceive it, especially with the shadows, which are kind of a giveaway, is um, as part of the floor. So you've, you, re you could read it both ways, and therefore it is ambiguous, enigmatic, enigmatic anything you want to call it. Um, this one, too, same thing. Is she emerging from this? Uh, fairy tale lake? Is she descending into it? This one is a cousin of the other flower picture. And you've got two conflicting cues if you want to know if she's coming up or down. Because the flower is definitely going up and she's definitely going down. And it looks like there are jets <laughs> propelled, but basically, as she comes down, she's sweeping up the flower and then jumping up and then she's going down again. So the mythological moment. I find that, again, in the edit, because not, not by layout or by design, I end up shooting things that take on a mythological or could. And I know I shouldn't say that he reminds me of Narcissus, but so I won't say that. <laughs> and this is not Orpheus and Eurydice. <laughs> and this is not a Sisyphean uh, scene from hell. <laughs> and this is not a person becoming an animal in a pool by moonlight in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> And 
this is exactly what you're seeing. Okay, this is the shortest section and my most favorite. <laughs> The moment multiplied. I just love reflections. I have been loving them since I took my first card as a photojournalist, which I kind of photographed into a mirror Those kind in the highways in small towns in Europe. They have mirrors for oncoming traffic. <laughs> photographed the landscape and the mirror. And um, yeah, I've done probably hundreds of mirror pictures. So um, there's just that added bit of mystery, obviously. And um, I like the fact that it incorporates the off-screen space because we've got one perspective of on the dancers, but and it's hard to see it in in this small scale. But um, the reflections nest within each other, and so it multiplies the the perspective that the camera provides. So I have a collection of these mirrors that we and mylar and reflective surfaces that okay so luckily we're getting to the end and I'm going to show you a preview of a whole new body of work I'm doing and uh, then I'm going to show you a video that a very talented intern took of one of our shoots so I really I'm not gonna I don't think I have to say anything about this you just see for yourself this is hanging up in my studio so now you see my studio where I've been for 10 years and you could also see the backdrop and the wood floor and by the way I love including the wood floor in my shots because it shows it really happened in a place um, and these prints are five foot big The color's a little off, but we don't mind. They look better on my monitor. <laughs> I've been working with her since she's 10 years old. From India, Pakistan? Hachi. Hachi. There she is again. This was actually a location shot. We went up to an asteroid, and um, <laughs> I brought just one strobe. <laughs> I couldn't count on natural light up there in the, <laughs> in the stratosphere. That's my daughter-in-law in her wedding dress. She was a dancer. I think, I don't think. And here's Hachi again. So now I'm going to show you this. Estrela na mostra o caminho, vai em um duro e hermoso. 
though in in conclusion <laughs> that um, my some of my team is here and I just want to they might be shy but um, <laughs> so I just want to introduce or mention Jack Diazo with whom I've been working for over 30 years who's been a uh, creative collaborator as well as many many other things and contributed so much to the work and um, and my current it's like what three years Chris Chris Attendido who's who spearheaded the whole one-to-one -one thing that I showed you and contributes so much to all my shots and keeps me sane as well <laughs> and Cameron my intern for the moment so that's it I thank you all Oh, questions. questions. Oh, yeah, time for questions. I'll pass around the mic. It's up to your voice. It's necessary for the video. Okay. Questions? No questions. Oh, no, no questions. <laughs> Here are the questions. Sorry. Give it yeah. Yeah. Okay. You do. The reflection uh, device that you use, what like material is that called? There are... There are different, div different reflective surfaces. The I don't really have names for them, things I find. or It's often not what it is, but how you use it and how you light it. Um, it could be as simple as plain plexiglass. In the video you saw was plain plexiglass. So uh, thank you very much. Okay. I'm like inspired, but it would be very clumsy. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, have you ever been asked or been interested in photographing underwater? I've never been asked. And um, I'm really pretty lazy. You know, I'm in my studio and I'm on a chair, a dry land, and I'm just sitting there and like asking the dancers to do so. And I, I'm so used to this controlled environment now that I, I don't know. And I mean, also that concept has been beautifully done by other photographers. Mm -hmm. And I usually shy away from that because it, I'm trying to find something new that's, um, yeah. I'm just wondering, in, in terms of um, your photographing, you said you weren't a dancer, but, no. but do you, you look like a dancer, Thank you. but do I you feel it. like a dancer when you're photographing? Do you feel like you're, you know, part of the whole dance, like you're completing it or they're completing you in um, some way? <coughs> it's sort of different because they're not dancing, in a sense. Most of these shots are like one, two, three, go. So I might demonstrate. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's a hard question because I'm not photographing dance. I'm photographing dancers. But you're making a dance out of the picture is a dance in a way. The picture right. could be could contain a dance, but it's it's like a split second dance. Um, so the question was. The question was, do you if you felt like you were dancing with them, but if it's not. In some no, way, we, creating that dance on the on the. Well, we're always the sculpting their gestures or their facial expressions, or um, not. So th they weren't in this slideshow, but we use a lot of fabrics, mainly you know for commercial work and other things. And then you know, Chris will throw it in a certain way. Jack will throw it. We've got fans going. We've got all this stuff. So it's sort of like more of a, a mini Hollywood <laughs> sound studio kind of thing. Yeah. I think we inspire them maybe because we are kind of lively and dancing and it's not any kind of clinical thing where we're telling them what to do and where to be and like we're, we're creating an atmosphere where they can blossom and they don't get to do that in a dance company. I was going to suggest maybe you could talk briefly about held. Okay. And that, that goes to kind of to the spirit of uh, Ellen's question. Right. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> 
sorry. Um, I'll make it shorter, right, than before. I'll give you the short answer. I was invited to create and per perform in a dance um, by the Australian Dance Theatre there in Adelaide, Australia. And I met them in 03, I think, and um, the choreographer asked if I would be interested in being on stage and shooting parts of the dance live. And I said, I really haven't done that in a long time. I don't have the skills anymore or the interest in it. But the dance was ended up being about my photography. So he brought me to Adelaide, and I photographed their um, dancers the way I would photograph anyone that washed up on my shore in the studio. I don't know anything about them, and we're going to make good pictures, as best pictures as we can make. And this company was is very ballistic and it really up my alley in terms of movement. I mean, when I agreed to this, I hadn't even, I didn't know what they were all about. So we take these these pictures, and um, the the choreographer then retrofitted them into the movement so that I could pluck them out on stage. So uh, I, that was the premise of that, and then the execution of it was on a theatrical stage where my strobes on each side, giving a broad illumination. I went out on stage tethered by a cord with a camera that didn't even quite have you know, um, the instantaneous shutter I have now. And with very little rehearsal, I would go in with some kind of plan for what I was going to shoot because everything I shot went up on the stage on two screens live. So within four seconds or five seconds, they're on screens. <clears throat> and that's kind of a horrifying position for anyone to be in. I mean, you know, you would never imagine a writer sitting on a computer and everything is like being published, you know, <laughs> without you know, delete, delete, delete. So um, <clears throat> it was kind of hair raising, but it was a, a thrilling experience and on many levels. Um, it was an unanticipated experience. I never expected to be doing this. It was a real challenge for me, and I was proud of the courage that I could go on stage, <laughs> a nervous wreck, and, um, you know, put myself out there like that. Now, of course, the people, the audience was happy with almost any <laughs> picture, because just the act of seeing the picture was, was exciting for them, whereas we all might be a little more sophisticated in terms of judging the picture. but. Um, they went up on square sc screens, and so they were somewhat cropped, and a lot of them were quite good. They were put, um, they were black and white, and what happened was it became like a duet with the dancers because everyone knew what I was going to shoot, I mean, and I had to go out with a plan because I had a zoom lens and all this stuff, and I'm as close as I am to you. So if I'm photographing you and you and everyone's around me, I have to sort of have a plan. And um, so the dancers knew the moment, and they would start to sculpt themselves. They knew it was coming, so, and we'd kind of, I'd raise my camera, zoom in, they'd come over and start to sculpt themselves, <coughs> and we'd take the picture. And it became interactive for the audience, because the second half of the show, they started imagining the pictures. They were taking them in their mind, having seen the action and then seeing the picture. And the um, other thing I really liked about it was, I'm talking about sculptural and permanent and, you know, how the ephemeral moment becomes as solid as stone kind of thing. So we can look at these pictures and they're, they're uh, well, they're permanent. But I was shooting, they were, these images, although theoretically I have JPEGs of them, they, they were intended to be projected and so the audience sees this projected leap caught, you know, and like, wow, how'd that ever happen? And 10 seconds later, it disappears. So the, the permanent surreal record is, is ephemeral. It just disappears. It's like catching the fish and throwing it back into water. And I love the fact that ultimately you couldn't hold on to anything in that show. And, you know, as photographers, we're all holding on to the picture and the frame and, the, you know, the whole thing is like, um, so that... I think that was all the things there. It was, and we toured the world. I mean, I said I could only, I couldn't do more than one show because I have a family, I have a studio, I have this, I have that, and uh, we did the Sydney Opera House, we did Sather's Wells, Teatro de la Ville, Japan, England, Italy, everything. So it was a very unexpected and and very creative, and actually whetted my appetite to do it again, someplace, something. What was the dance group? The Australian Dance Theatre. Oh, okay. 
and they appear at the Joyce here, and they, they tour all over. And we're still talking about working. <laughs> as long as I can bend my knees and crash down. <laughs> we did it at the Joyce Theater in 2005 or six. Yeah, we did it at the Joyce. It was great. And we, it was, it was great. Um, the, the one thing you, you touched on that I'm interested in is the expression of time. And I don't know if you're familiar with the French philosopher Gauss de Lue. He talks about the. De Lue? Yeah. He talks about the present <coughs> is the past becoming mm -hmm. and how you look at slices of time. And it just, it just hit me that what you're doing actually embodies what he does, what he speaks about. Have you ever transferred from dance to other photography with slices of time? Hmm. Well, I guess my area of inquiry would be things that move. I've done a lot of athletes. Yeah, they're really good. So, yeah, I've done a lot of athletes. And um, anything? Can't think of any. But I'll have to, I'll have to read him. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's very fascinating. Hmm. Um. So I also shoot ballerinas, and I myself was a dancer for nine years. So for me, shooting it, having that knowledge of dance and how the body moves, it helps me a lot. Um, and my knowledge of it, is, at least, is just feminine. Like, I know how the female body moves, it, being a ballerina and everything. But I find it hard to shoot male dancers. So I guess my question to you is, do you know, like, between every dancer you shoot, do you notice a difference in their movement? And do you have to change your shooting style to fit? them? Hmm. Um, I, I don't change my shooting style because then my, my style is that I'm going to respond to what's in front of me and work with them. I actually started this whole thing with two dancers, two male dancers. And in some ways I was probably, and that's because by chance actually it happened, but I was probably more wary of ballerina. First of all, ballet is not my area anyway. I mean, I end up shooting a ton of ballet, but it's, um, it doesn't afford me the possibilities, the freedom of reinterpreting movement or inventing movement. It's more codified as a vocabulary and therefore limited in its imagery. So, but I think the dancers, but this was back in the day, they, the men had more skills and they had more power and can do all these interesting things. Nowadays, um, I know the dancers that I see can do everything, male, female, they can do hip-hop, jazz, tap, ballet. So you can get everything in one. But at the beginning, I think I needed that acrobatic gymnastic thing. And um, although Ashley, who's some favorites here, she, I worked with her for 15 years. And so I think she's my, other than Hachi, my longest. And because she embodied both that strength and grace. And the men that I want to shoot have strength and grace. So you have to have both together. Um, Ashley actually was a gymnast before she Yes. Was many of them were. David Parsons was a gymnast, and many of them mm -hmm. were. Right. And I need that skill. I think the women are getting tougher, which is good. And they're not, we're, no longer relegated to delicate things. And I look for creativity more than skill. You know, there are people who are, have incredible skill, but they can only do the positions they've learned and they can't improvise. And okay, thank you, everybody. Lois, thank, thank you for you. a great lecture. Thank you very much.